I'm always fascinated with uh, Cecil B. DeMille's film, The Ten Commandments. Whatever else you may say about DeMille, he was one of the greats in the industry, and he, organ he really was one of the initiators of a tradition in the movie industry of incredible attention to accuracy within the, the scope of their understanding. The DeMille f films were generally excessively precise to properties, details, and so forth. But I was very fascinated with what I regard as a glaring error. There are probably many that we could make a list of sometime if we were at camp around a fireside, it's a casual conversation, it'd be fun to make a list of the discrepancies you can find in that film. But um, one of them was when Charlton Heston comes down from the mountain and has under his arm the two tables of stone. And uh, I would find it irresistible to have him in his other arm carrying a set of blueprints. <laughs> because there are, there's one chapter devoted to the Ten Commandments. There are ten chapters devoted to those blueprints. And that's the threshold that we're on tonight. Actually, a chapter just ahead of that, but I think chapter 24, the chapter that we are going to address tonight, sets the pace for the next major section of the book of Exodus, chapters 25 through 40. That's quite a block of scripture, with the exception of a two-chapter parenthesis in that block of chapters, from 25 through 40, with the exception of two chapters. They all have to do with the tabernacle. And so we're about to enter into uh, one of the most interesting uh, parts of the scripture. So um, in anticipation of that, let's uh, move right in. Uh, we'll treat uh, chapter 24, sort of a preamble to this, and uh, chapter 24, verse 1. And he said unto Moses, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship afar off. It's very interesting, of course, Moses and Aaron we hear a lot about, but you're going to be sensitive to the fact that Nadab and Abihu are mentioned a great deal. They're sort of an inner circle. They apparently have a very privileged position. And I think they're, they're there for our learning because you're going to see their names come up frequently. And then later on in Levit Leviticus, you'll discover they get destroyed by fire for having you know, offered strange fire before the Lord. Now, one of the lessons of those two people is that office and position are no guarantee of salvation. So as you see their name, you might just recognize that while on the one hand you see them here quite favored, they end up with a rather um, startling finish. Verse 2, Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but they shall, they shall not come near, neither shall the people go up with him. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord hath said we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people, and they said, All that the Lord hath said we will do, and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. Uh, verse 9 then went up Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in its clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel he laid not his hand, and they saw God and did eat and drink. Let's pause here for, uh, for a couple of things. Um, we could spend a lot of time tonight on this whole idea of the blood, but we're going to be talking so much about that later. I thought what we'll do here is just make reference to this. A couple of obs uh, observations. Those of you that would like a commentary on this whole area, I commit to your homework for next 
week when you've obviously got some free time, you might want to study carefully Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. We'll refer to that chapter frequently in the forthcoming time, but you might just notice Hebrew chapter 9, verses 18, 19, and 20 specifically refer to this, but uh, that's a, uh, an ample, competent, I mean much more competent, uh, commentary on the significance of the blood, the, the, the blood thing here. Um, some, another observation that uh, you might be sensitive to is that every covenant tends to be uh, ratified by blood, and even the, and they usually have, it's preceded by sacrifice. An example of that was the covenant with Noah, which was preceded by sacrifices in Genesis 8, and then again in Genesis 15. And uh, for those of you that would find that uh, interesting, could, uh, ch you know, chase that down. We now come to a Fascinating passage of scripture. This little passage in here in, in um, Exodus 24 is often overlooked because we generally don't think of the nation being face to face. We generally don't think of the nation, you know, uh, in the presence of God. Uh, we frequently make, you know, make reference to Ezekiel chapter 1 and Isaiah chapter 6, Daniel chapter 7. Uh, Revelation chapters 4 and 5 as examples, perhaps the most prominent examples of being confronted with the throne of God. And if you haven't done so, I commend to you to, to review those chapters. Uh, Ezekiel, I think it's chapter 1 and then maybe again in 10. Certainly Isaiah chapter 6. These are where we have the seraphim in the one case and cherubim in the other and we have the, fa the four faces and, and all these things. And then also Daniel chapter 7, we have a, a vision where Daniel is confronted with the throne of God. Um, we study that frequently because there's some very interesting discrepancies between Daniel's view of the throne of God and the one that we have in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. It's interesting that Daniel sees the thrones, but he doesn't see, thrones plural, but he doesn't see the 24 elders. And some people make a big thing of that. They may or may not be significant, but it is an interesting observation that there are those discrepancies. What's obviously even more obvious, or more conspicuous, is the similarities between those accounts. We have made reference to those in the past, and we'll make reference to those again uh, as we study the, the, the uh, tabernacle for various reasons. So I won't belabor it tonight, but I mention it, I throw it out for those of you that uh, are, you know, need time to fill, uh, you know, your study time between now and the time we meet two weeks from tonight. Uh, you might take on a sort of a survey of the visions of the throne of God. You'll discover some interesting things. Um, in the Revelation account, of course, we have, well, we're going to, discuss, we're going to study the, ta the tabernacle. We'll notice the labor where we have the water, which is for the washing, and we'll contrast that to the glassy sea in Revelation, where in the one case, the saints are washing in it, in another case, they're standing on it. Well, it's interesting also in the Revelation account and other Old Testament accounts, the throne of God, we have this reference to the sapphire or green light. And it's interesting, here in Exodus, again, we have this reference. They saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone. How interesting. And as it were, the, the body of heaven in its clearness. I don't know what to make of that. I, I have no great contribution to make in terms of some remarkable insight. We'll make a few comments when we get into the tabernacle itself and its modeling of these things. But um, I do commend to you a comparison. Make a little notebook and compare the accounts. Ezekiel 1, 10, Isaiah 6, Daniel 7, Revelation 4 and 5. And uh, use your Strong's or Young's or whatever your concordance is and uh, cross-reference some of these things. You'll find them very, very fascinating. You'll find that the Holy Spirit is the same author of all the accounts. There's evidence of that by the way he expresses it all. And yet at the same time, each account will give you some different additional insight uh, as the Holy Spirit might provide to you. Another thing that's interesting is verse 11. And, the noble, and uh, upon the nobles of, uh, of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. In other words, there was nothing, you know, he didn't uh, somehow, you know, judge them or something for being present there. In fact, they are apparently comfortable enough to eat and drink. You generally don't eat and drink if you're, you know, quaking with fear or, or uh, whatever, you know. It's interesting fellowship going on here. They did eat and drink. I think that's, I think that's uh, you know, we can quickly pass over that verse and miss the impact of this. Uh, interesting fellowship. Well, moving on. Verse 12, And the Lord said unto Moses, 
come up to me in the mount and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. And Moses rode up and his, and his servant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mount of God. Now that's kind of interesting that Joshua went and uh, Aaron didn't. I mean, uh, Joshua was a minister unto Moses, and he, his own career is absolutely fascinating, especially when you recognize he is, in effect, a namesake of Jesus Christ, Yehoshua. And the book of Joshua carries much additional meaning if you recognize that and follow his career and understand uh, that. And if you, uh, I commend to you, if you haven't studied the book of Joshua, there are tapes available, what have you. It's an interesting study. But recognize that he was Moses' confidant, his close associate, his minister here, that he picks up the leadership when Moses passes, passes it to him. Verse 14, And he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us until we come again unto you. And behold, Aaron and her are with you. And if any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. And Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mountain. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud, and the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went up into the midst of the cloud and got up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. A couple, before we leave chapter 24, it's kind of, uh, we could... We could spend a lot of time, I think, talking about the glory of the Lord. We could talk about the, being in his presence. Um, but what, well, the only observation I think I'd like to leave with you on chapter 24 for your thinking, your consideration, is that this, in a revelation sense, direct revelation sense, so to speak, for the average person, for the people of Israel, was a high point. It, in the 1,500 years of subsequent history, it was never to be matched. In fact, what's interesting is 40, within the 40 days and 40 night time period of this high point, what does the nation do? They build themselves something interesting, a golden calf, a golden calf to worship. <coughs> Now, the leadership, of course, indeed continued to be ordained, but the people uh, obviously uh, never again had this experience. Why do I emphasize this? Because the experience that was available to them only through their leaders is now available to you and I forever, directly, directly. That's what the tabernacle is all about. Not this portable tent thing, but what John says in his gospel, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And the whole tabernacle thing is an attempt to teach us what the presence of Jesus Christ can mean to you and I, personally, personally. So we're about to embark on a next section of the book of Exodus which if in your, in your outlines you might dub chapters 25 through 40, noting, however, that uh, verses 30, uh, chapters 32 and, uh, uh, through 34 are sort of a parenthesis. If you recognize that, the rest of it is on the, on the, uh, on the tabernacle. Uh, we all know, if, we, if we've done memory verses, we all know John 3.16, right? How many of you know John 3.16, right? Okay. You should know all the 316s. How many of you know 2 Timothy 316? How many of you know? Can someone listen? All scripture? Well, how's it go? Is inspired? Go on, yes. For our instruction? For reproof and correction? That we through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have hope, right? Which scripture? What's the first word? All scripture. Very, very important verse. It's the verse that, it's one of the verses I use to defend my rather weird viewpoint. And I say it that way, not facetiously. I have a rather extreme view in applying that scripture. I argue that it says all. It means all. Every comma, every word, every number, every place name. So uh, all scripture is given. Okay, good. 
Another verse that you might also put, if you haven't put 2 Timothy 3.16 on your notepad, in the upper right-hand corner, you probably ought to put three verses. Acts 17.11, of course, goes first, where, uh, you know, uh, Luke reminds us uh, not to believe anything that Chuck Missler tells you, but to check it yourself. A second verse you might put would be 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures given by the inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness, that we through the patience and so forth. The other one you might put is Romans 15.4. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for textual criticism, to make answers to exams, no. Were written for our learning. Whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning, right? In fact, I guess I'm screwing up the two verses, aren't I? I'm sorry. The, last, the tail end of the other one is the way that one ends, okay. Which, is, which proves Acts 17.11 is right. Don't trust me. <laughs> Look them up. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 and Romans 15.4. Um... Another one in that vein that are sort of cornerstones for my peculiar approach would be Hosea. I think it's Hosea chapter 12. Hosea chapter 12, 4, I think it is. Correction, 12, 10. Hosea 12, 10, Old Testament, God speaking, he says, I have also spoken by the prophets, and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. He argues that he uses similitudes or types or analogies or models. And we're going to see what perhaps is the greatest of these as we embark on the study of the tabernacle. I'm going to argue to you tonight that this section of the scripture, section 20, uh, Exodus 25 through chapter 40, is the most blessed but the least read of any portion of the scripture, certainly of the book of Exodus. I'm going to argue to you that more space is devoted, more space in the scripture is devoted to this particular object than any other in the scripture. Except, uh, obviously, if you include Jesus Christ as a subject, that's, you know, another idea. But I'm, I'm saying as a, su as, a, as a specific denotative subject, there's more space devoted to the tabernacle than any other, any other single item. Very interesting. There's only two chapters on the entire creation. And there's ten chapters directly on the tabernacle right here, let alone Leviticus and whatever else. Okay? Another interesting observation before I plunge in. It's fascinating to me. And my, my son happens to be in his postgraduate work at SC. He's an architect. And he, of course, has uh, traveled and studied architecture, like most guys that are interested in architecture do. And if you study, you know, man's knowledge, you discover that um, there's architectural studies that deal with the pyramids of Egypt, right? Great architectural mar marvel of the world. Uh, they study the abbeys of Europe. Fascinating how, how interested they get in these ancient abbeys of England or, you know, Europe in general. They study all kinds. Uh, you know, his library is full of books studying the architectural ideas embodied in various temples of the heathen. I think it's kind of interesting. I think it's kind of interesting that, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I didn't get a chance to ask him but I, I do not, I'm not sensitive personally, because I'm pretty sure he would have called my attention to it had he encountered in any of his entire library of architectural history any comments on what's probably the most important architecture on the planet Earth. The, planet, the, the architecture of the tabernacle, which was then, you know, broadened and amplified in the temple. Interesting. Best of my knowledge, very little uh, emphasis on that. I'm also intrigued at how, ma how much scholastic study has been aimed at textual criticism. Did so-and-so really write that then? You know, that nonsense. And how much, how little, relatively, has been to the, the subject itself. So I'd like to, uh, as we get into this, uh, do a little, uh, do some preamble, you know, uh, studies here. I'm going to suggest to you that the tabernacle has at least three meanings. It speaks of God in having his dwelling place. It's going to speak of Jesus Christ as a type or a model, and it's going to also model Christ's presence in the church. Uh, for the first example, let's turn to Hebrews 9. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people, according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats and, of, and with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all the things are by law purged with blood. Without the shedding of blood is no remission. The, argu the argument going here to, uh, to the significance of just what the, the blood testament meant. 
But I want you to notice verse 23. I think it's a very, very pivotal verse in our study, especially the tabernacle. Verse 23, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifice than these. Patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. With what things? With the shedding of blood. But what things? The tabernacle, no. It is simply a pattern of, of a larger reality. But the heavenly things, incidentally, are themselves they're purged, you're purified, not with these, that is with blood, yes, but not, it's saying, but with better sacrifices than these. In other words, not just goats and such. They're just a type, a model. Verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Notice that? That the, the holy places made with hands are a model of the true reality. So as we study the tabernacle or the temple, we should study them as models of the heavenlies itself, the presence of God itself, as we and, and compare that and contrast that and amplify it as we see it in vision in Ezekiel 1, 10, Isaiah 6, Revelation 4, these various places where we see the throne of God. And then, of course, the writer in Hebrews here makes a contrast to the tradition which pointed to this prophetically and the actual by saying, not that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth in the holy place every year with blood of others, for then he must have often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the ages hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, as it pointed unto men once to die and after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sin of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And he goes on to amplify and explain. Okay, the patterns of things in the heavens, okay, are simply figures. I mean, what we're dealing with here are figures of the true, okay? Uh, we could amplify this, Second Chronicles 6, uh, Jeremiah chapter uh, 17, Psalm 24, Revelation 15, as other examples of this. Um, but let's leave some of that amplification until we get to the tabernacle itself. Let's talk a little bit about the idea of Jesus Christ being modeled by the tabernacle. Let's turn to Second Corinthians 5.19. Second Corinthians. What was the purpose of the tabernacle in Israel? It was where God dwelt, right? God dwelt in the tabernacle, right? Well, let's take a look at 2 Corinthians 5, 19. And notice what Paul says. He uses this idiom many times, but this is an example. Verse 19, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Where did God, where is God said to dwell here? In Christ. Where, where did God, where was God said to dwell in Exodus? in the tabernacle. So already we could begin to infer perhaps a parallel. Turn to Colossians 2.19. Colossians chapter 2, excuse me, 2.9. Colossians 2.9. Very often quoted phrase about our Lord. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The entire epistle to the Colossians emphasizes that issue that in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I'm going to argue to you there again. We have a model, an example, which justifies our looking at Christ in effect as some kind of ultimate tabernacle. Let's turn to Hebrews again, chapter 10 this time, verse 5. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, where the writer says, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. Jesus Christ spoke of himself as a temple. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Right? We could go on and on and on. We could, we could belabor this. And the temple, of course, was, you know, in effect, a rendering of the tabernacle. In the, in the third sense, let's just uh, to amplify the third sense that we're going to look at this, let's take a look at John chapter 1. And I suppose we should always take the first three verses here. In the beginning was the Word, title of Jesus Christ. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning without God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And we go on. He establishes right up front 
the, the pre-existence and the uh, separate identity, both, of Jesus Christ. And he, he develops that, and then he gets to verse 14, introducing the concept that the Word was the title of Jesus Christ. Verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwelt is tabernacled among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace. What was the purpose of the tabernacle? What did it contain? What was inside the Holy of Holies? The Shekinah glory. It's where God dwelt. In Christ we, we beheld his glory, John writes. One last thing, so, and then we'll get uh, enough of this preamble. Je Revelation, Revelation 21, 3. Chapter 21, he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the first heaven and the first earth was passed away, and there was no more sea. Verse 3, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. That's the climax. That's the climax. If you start a study of the tabernacle, that's where you end. That's the, that's the climax. The tabernacle. It might be useful, before we jump into a lot of other detail, to talk, we're going to talk about the tabernacle in detail, but before we do, it might be useful to physically describe what it is we're talking about up front. So as we talk about the elements, you could put them in perspective. And this is also a place where I have both been given, but also have for many years ago developed an elaborate set of slides to talk about this, and it's tempting to use that, except it's hard in a group this size, it's a large group. But also, it may even be more useful to describe it. So you, as I describe it, you can take your own notes, and also from the tape, it might be more useful to try and just try to do word pictures rather than, than, than you know, throw on a screen renderings of various scholars and other things. Physically, the tabernacle in its connotative or broad sense consisted really, and I'll describe this just in, in a way as if we were going to make it, if we were going to build one out here. Let's assume that you and I were going to try and construct something roughly life size that would act as sort of a project or as, you know, as a, as a, just an, you know, as a maybe rather ambitious, you know, school project. Um, we would probably uh, find an area in the field that's roughly 75 feet by 150 feet in area. And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to argue right now how much a cubit was. I'm going to assume it's roughly a foot and a half, just to give you this rough figure. And I'm doing all this from memory, so my numbers may be a little off. But uh, what we first thing we would do is fence that area in with a linen canvas slightly higher than eye level. So as you walk up to it, all you would see would be this sort of canvas wall encompassing this yard. We would have only one door on it. We would leave an opening on the east end. If you visualize this thing as a rectangle, we would make, it, uh, make the long axis east and west. And we would make the uh, entrance, the, the entrance to the yard, if you will, only one of them. And that's on the east. And as we moved in, into the court, this courtyard put about by this linen canvas, the first thing we put in front of us would be a brazen altar, an altar of brass. And it would be on that altar of brass that we would plan to offer the sacrifices. Brass is the, was the metal that they were familiar with that would contain heat. It would hold fire. It was, a, it was able to withstand high temperatures. Therefore, if you were building a cauldron or something that was going to bear intense heat, you'd make it of brass. Therefore, brass spoke of fire. And because brass spoke of fire, brass also spoke of judgment. In Numbers, we read of the brazen serpent, meaning as a, as a type of sin judged. So we have this brazen altar, which is where we offer the burning sacrifices. The next thing we would encounter would be what's called the laver. Unfortunately, in the quaint language of the King James, your old English Bibles might use the term the molten sea. And that's an unfortunate translation. The word molten there really means brass. What it really was, was a brazen laver or bowl. Uh, and it was filled with water for washing. And if you think of it as a laver, it's a little more descriptive, but don't be thrown by the fact that if you read some of the, you know, the, 
Old English Bibles, you'll hear it spoken of as the molten sea. Uh, it's a brass bowl filled with water is what they're really trying to communicate, and unfortunately the translation's a little clumsy. Then behind these two items, there's this strange building. And this building is assembled with boards. These boards are made of wood covered with gold, and they're fitted. They, they uh, are a foot and a half, two feet wide, say, and they are vertically fitted so that if you assemble them vertically, they're fitted with fixtures so that they can, you can put a rod through them, it'll, it'll make a, a wall. And this building, if you visualize it as if it's made of three cubes, Fifth, if you had three cubes 15 feet on a cube, the first building is two of those. That is 15 feet wide, 15 feet high, and 30 feet deep. And you have to go into it. And an extension of that then is another cube, 15 by 15 by 15, which is the Holy of Holies. The first part, in other words, you've got three-thirds, if you will. The first thing you enter would be two-thirds of it, 15 feet wide, 15 feet high, and 30 feet deep. That's called the holy place. Through it you can enter, and only through it can you enter, the inner sanctum, if you will, called the Holy of Holies. Don't confuse the holy place with the Holy of Holies. You'll find that's easily done. If you speak of the holy place, you really mean generally. The holy place can be all-inclusive, but it really denotatively refers to the, the, the first part that you enter in this building. Now, the interesting thing about this building is that it's covered with all kinds of strange things. Goat's hair, and, and uh, badger skins, and linen, and so forth. But what's fascinating about it, as we study it, you'll discover these, these, these gold-covered planks that make it up are visible only from the inside. Because the outside's covered with goat's hair and these other things, and the last thing are these badger skins. Before we get into that, in, there are seven appliances or pieces of furniture described relative to the tabernacle. Physically, there's the sort of like a fence thing around the outside, for the, which might, what you and I might call a courtyard, and then there's this building in the middle. And the building itself is draped so that it looks perhaps very strange from the outside. And you go inside, and you have a large room and then a smaller room. We have seven appliances. We've already mentioned two of them. The brazen altar outside, the, bra the, uh, the brass laver next. That's all that's outside. In the, then inside, you have, as you enter, on the right side, you have a table on which there are 12 loaves of unleavened bread, so-called showbread, used there for ceremonial purposes. On the left side, you have what you and I might call a menorah. Again, the, we often use the term golden candlestick. That's also un an unfortunate term because it wasn't lit by candles, it was lit by what? Oil. So it's really a lampstand. That same mistranslation occurs in chapter 1 of the book of Revelation, where we speak of the seven candlesticks. They're not candlesticks, they're lampstands. They're lampstands. But again, as an artifact of the translation, it's, a, it's unfortunate. But in any case, as you walk in, we have the lampstand, seven-branched lampstand, not eight. Don't be confused. The eight-branched lampstand is a thing that's unique to Hanukkah, not a mosaic feast. Tradition of Hanukkah came out of the Maccabean period. Feast of Lights and so forth, the eight and all that. Don't confuse that with the menorah, a, a seven-branched lampstand, which is the official symbol of the state of Israel. And it is, of course, comes from this unique thing in the tabernacle. Then as you go to the end of this room, there's a, a doorway to get into the Holy of Holies that's veiled. They have a veil there. There's some confusion by scholars as to where the next thing I'm going to mention sits. It's called the golden altar. Don't confuse it with the brazen altar. The brazen altar is a large thing outside they put burnt offerings on. What's called the golden altar is actually an incense holder. Something smaller, more manageable, made of gold, and it burned, but it burned incense. It's usually described as if it stood inside the Holy of Holies. 
but for reasons I f I'm not sure I can re uh, recount to you in detail, most scholars believe it actually st stood just outside the veil in the, ho in the holy place, not in the Holy of Holies. And it's very possible that the practice may have changed from through time, and, this, and there's, a, there's a lot of detail about the tabernacle that uh, scholars tend to uh, see somewhat controversial as, uh, because of strange references here and there. But the golden lampstand, the thing that carried the incense, is often somehow described always with the stuff that's in the Holy of Holies on the one hand, but there's other evidence to indicate that it stood just outside the Holy of Holies by the veil. Now this veil is that which you and I might consider more like a tapestry. Don't confuse it with the temple veil, which I understand was 18 feet thick. Okay, it's a different, you know, we speak of veil. You and I, we semantically think of a bridal veil or something frail. We think of a veil as something you can see through. A veil, as the, in terms of the translation from which the word was taken, was a, you know, a, a barrier, a cloth, a, a something to cause separation. And in the tabernacle, being a portable device, a portable, if you'll excuse the, the, you know, like a mobile home kind of thing, in contrast to the temple, which was a permanent place. I wasn't trying to be cute. I was, the point is, the structure of it, you'll see, is all engineered to be portable, to be moved. Where the temple was built permanent, built in the same architecture, amplified, <laughs> Same concepts are there. There's a brass altar outside. There's a big laver. Then you go into this. The first part of the building is the holy place, and there's the, you know, the lampstands and the showbread. Then you go through the temple. You know, the veil. There's actually several veils. When they speak of the veil, they mean the veil that, that shields the holy place, the holy of holies. And I understand from some authorities that that was uh, not a little. Just a, you know, you sometimes think of it maybe an ornate but large tapestry. In fact, there's some scholastic reason to believe it was an incredible piece of work, and literally. Uh, uh, 18, that's 18, I mean 18 inches thick. Is that what I, that, what did I say? I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm very tired, excuse me. I'm sorry, no, I mean 18 inches, 18 inches thick, I mean thick, thick material. That's why when it was torn from top to bottom, that was no trivial thing. Um, that Christ was crucified. Now anyway, getting inside the holy place, there are two pieces of furniture. You and I, if we were there, would visualize it as one. But it's always described separately. The main thing that we would confront, or would confront our gaze, would be the Ark of the Covenant, a box that's approximately coffin-sized, with two poles to carry. You know, as you, you would like uh, pole bearers in a sense. I don't, I'm using this just to create an image in your mind, not for any other reason. Um, inside of which were the two tables of stone with the Ten Commandments. At certain times of its history, it had a pot of manna in it. It had Aaron's rod that budded. And uh, scholars are divided as to what other things it might or might not have had in it. Now, the lid of that device, you and I would tend to regard as part of the Ark of the Covenant. But in the scriptures, always described separately. The lid, the Ark of the Covenant, was, of course, was made of wood overlaid with gold. But the lid was solid gold. And on it were emblazoned two cherubim. And... Uh, God is spoken of as dwelling between the cherubim. Dwelling between the cherubim. And of course, once a year, only, only one person would ever enter the Holy of Holies. And that was only the high priest. And he did it only on one day, the Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And only after incredible ceremonial preamble, including seven washings and on and on. And as he went in there, um, he would sprinkle the blood for the sins of the nation on the mercy seat. And the concept was that what was tempted to sort of model here is as God would look down and see the broken law, he would, be, he would be tempered by the, he would see first the shed blood, making atonement for that broken law. That's why they call it the mercy seat. Okay? Even though it was gold, it looks, sounds very elaborate, you've got to recognize it was blood sprinkled. So we have the brazen altar, the laver, the table of showbread, the seven-branched lampstand. We have the uh, golden altar or golden incense thing. We have the Ark of the Covenant, and we have the mercy seat. How many? Seven. Amazing, isn't it? Now, it's my thesis that we'll discuss as we go, is that every one of those seven pieces of furniture point to Jesus Christ. Every one of those pieces of furniture have as its purpose, in fact, perhaps its ultimate purpose, is to portray some aspect of Jesus Christ. 
I'm going to further argue that every piece of wood, every fixture, every color, every material, where it came from, how it was used, points to Jesus Christ. Crazy theory. Crazy hypothesis. I can't prove it. You will either see it or you won't as we go through. Obviously, we had the... Um, let's, just, let's just approach this imaginary project we've made. We've made this model. As we walk up to it, let's just also assume that we're going to divide up into 12 tribes. And let's assume we were going to encamp, as Israel did. The, the door of the tabernacle, it was, of course, in the center of the camp, in the midst of the camp, right? And as we approach the door of the tabernacle, we would have to go through what tribe? Tribe of Judah. You approached through the tribe of Judah. It camped to the east. Isn't that interesting? Where did Jesus Christ come to us through? The tribe of Judah. Now we get to the door, we discover there's one door. One door. He says in John 10, 9, I am what? The door. The door. Anyone else enters by any, by any other way but me as a thief and a robber, right? Those of you that like to get into big doctrines, something occurred to me tonight when I was organizing my notes. I don't think I've ever said this before, and it's probably heresy. But that's your, <laughs> but that's your assignment to come to your own conclusion. One of the things that's very important about the tabernacle, it has only one entrance. Much is said about that in the scripture. Clearly that's one way, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, right? And we go on and on on this theme. I won't hammer it to death. I'm going to suggest to you something. Nowhere in the scripture do I read of there being an exit. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? Yeah, okay. So that should stir up, you know, lots of, lots of controversy. Because you could say, well, you, go out, you can go out by the, door, by the way you came in. Maybe, but I don't see that in the scripture. <laughs> Now, as we approach this thing, we see only white linen. That's all we can see as we approach this thing, white linen. All we see is righteousness. All we see is righteousness. But if we enter in, we can only do it by the way of the altar, by the way of sacrifice. Before we can go any further, there has to be a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice. And you know who I'm talking about. After we have the sacrifice and we get by that, we still can't go in the holy place. You know what you have to do? You have to wash purification. What does the water speak of idiomatically? The word, right. Now you're clean by the washing of the water, you know, and so forth, right? by the word which I have spoken to you. Interestingly enough, that's the only dimension that's not specified in the scripture is the size of that labor. It has no limit. Of all the specific, as you get, as you get through the text, you'll be fascinated at the incredible detail of the rest of this stuff. And the labor, if you study it carefully, starts to leap out at you as being non-dimensioned. Now Solomon, in rendering the temple, of course, had to dimension, and he did. But, but in this, uh, if, I'm, if, I, if my memory serves me correctly, in the uh, Torah, the Pentateuch, uh, the uh, tabernacle has an undimensioned labor. But anyway, you then have to wash. You can't go, by the way, you can't do any of this stuff unless you're a priest, incidentally. You don't go into the holy place unless you're a priest. But if you're a king and a priest and so forth, you can get by that. We get into the holy place. Now, as we enter the holy place, that's the place of fellowship. There we have the bread. What did Jesus Christ say? I am the bread, right? As we walk in there, we discover something kind of interesting. In the outer court, it's illuminated by natural light. Oh, one other thing. As we approach the holy place, we can't see its glory. We can't see the gold and all these incredible tapestries and things that will be described. But rather, what we see are these dull, drab, what, what some scholars believe are porpoise skins covering the tabernacle. I'm going to suggest to you that as we approach it, it has no form nor comeliness. It has no beauty that we should desire it. But as we go inside, we have the bread. And we are also struck by the source of light. There's only one source of light inside the holy place. Seven-branched candlestick, right? The candlestick, as we'll see, was described exactly how they were to make it. They were, make it, they were to make it out of a solid piece of gold. They had a basic 
stem and six branches. Six is the number of men. I am the vine, ye are the branches. How interesting. Ye are what? His light bearers. Right? What's the source of light? Oil. What's oil speak of Old Testament in the Levitical idiom? The Holy Spirit illuminates the inside. We get up there, there's the golden lampstand, or the, I shouldn't say the golden lampstand, it's actually incense. The golden altar as it's described, but it's actually a thing that burns incense. What does incense speak of Levitically? Prayers of the saints. Some people even argue prayers of intercession. I think they're all prayers. Prayers are spoken of as incense that rises to the nostrils of God. Okay? Now, if we qualify ceremonially through uh, observing the right procedure, and if you're the, the high priest and only the high priest, on one occasion, you can go through the veil and you come to the Holy of Holies. What illuminates the Holy of Holies? Shekinah glory. The Shekinah glory. You're in the presence of God himself. And there's the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Testimony, his commitment to you, based on grace and mercy, the blood on the mercy seat. And uh, we have a very, very interesting model. Then now, I've given you an overview. I've tried to do it verbally rather than using charts and diagrams so you can somehow visualize this in your notes or if someone's listening to the tape, they can get an overall view of this thing. The tabernacle is, of course, the basic structure that's amplified by the temple. Right? Temple's uh, bigger. All the dimensions are exaggerated, larger, made permanent, of course, and very, very elegant in the way it's attempted, I'm going to suggest to you that the tabernacle was a temporary abode, portable, temporary abode. The tabernacle was used in the wilderness. I'm going to suggest to you that, um, let's first of all take a look at the tabernacle as it might uh, point to Jesus Christ. It was temporary, a temporary abode. It was used in the wilderness. If you recall, Jesus Christ was born in a manger, had no place to lay his head during his career, and was buried in a borrowed tomb. Okay. Do you know how long the tabernacle was used by Israel in the wilderness? Less than 35 years. I don't have any proof that it was 33. It's my guess. I'm going to suggest to you it was mean, humble, unattractive, outwardly. It had no form nor comeliness, no beauty that we should desire it. Interesting analogy. It was God's dwelling place between the cherubim. We read from John how we beheld his glory as he tabernacled among us. It's where God met with man. Do you remember? Well, throughout the Old Testament, you'll find the tabernacles also described as the tent of meeting. You heard that expression? In the Old Testament, you hear the tent of meeting. That isn't some place where they got together to vote on you know, town councils and things. The tent of meeting is, a, is an Old Testament phrase for the same thing we're talking about, i.e., the, the, uh, the tabernacle. It's where God met with man. And, of course, we can think of uh, many passages uh, John 14:6, 1 Timothy 2:5, and so forth. That Jesus Christ is where God meets with us. Uh, the tabernacle was, of course, at the center of Israel's camp. If we study Numbers 1:50, 2:17, Numbers 11:24 and 25, we discover that the tabernacle is at the center of the camp of Israel. It was in the area managed by the tribe of Levi, and we had the 12 tribes organized around in 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 uh, four camps of three tribes each. And uh, when we get to that, we'll go through the whole model, and we'll talk about how that turns out to be a model of the throne of God in some very unusual ways. Anyway, the tabernacle was the center of Israel's camp. It was in the midst of the camp. We always hear the tabernacle being in the midst of the camp, right? And against that idea, I suggest to you Matthew 18, 20, where Jesus Christ says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I where? In the midst of you. The tabernacle was a place where the law was preserved. The law was preserved. Exodus 32, 19, Deuteronomy 10 deals with the obvious thing that tabernacles where the law was established to be and preserved and so forth. Remember Psalm 48? You should remember Psalm 48. Let's take you back there. Psalm 48. Jesus Christ quoted eight centuries before he was born. Well, it's 40, verse 7 and then 8. Verse 7. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me, I will delight to do thy will, O God. Yea, thy law is where? Within my heart. Who's speaking? Jesus Christ. Psalm 40, 
Psalm 48, okay. Now, also the tabernacle is the place where the sacrifice is made, right? All that points to Jesus Christ. It's the place where the priestly family was fed, right? We could go into the bread of life things. Where are we fed? Okay, in Jesus Christ. It's the place of worship, right? And we can worship God only in Jesus Christ. Not only do we worship God in Jesus Christ, it's the only place you can. According to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And you can take Hebrews 13, 15, and other places too. And of course, as I've emphasized before, there's only one door. It's very strange for a structure that large with that kind of use. You know, it, it's very... <laughs> The other thought that occurred to me is that the tabernacle would not pass the building codes today, would it? <laughs> and that's a pun in many ways. That's a pun in many ways. But um, anyway, Jesus, of course, said, I am the door, John 10, and so forth. And it's approached to the tribe of Judah, as we've covered. In Numbers chapter 2, verse 3, we know that the tabernacle opened to the east. Or correction, we know that Judah was to the east in Exodus 27, verses 12 through 20, uh, 17. We know that the tabernacle door moved to, was open to the east. And, of course, in Revelation 5, we find that our access to the throne of grace is by the lion of the tribe of Judah. And you can run with that one. Um, if we wanted to extend this further, there's a couple other thoughts I'll just throw out. You can, they may appeal to you or not. They may be pushing something a little too far. His universal lordship is hinted by the numerous materials. If you go through all the materials, everything you can think of is there. Haggai 2.8 speaks of that all the gold and silver is mine, saith the Lord, right? Psalm 50 verse 10 says that the, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, etc. You can go through a whole bunch of verses and put those behind every one of those pieces of materials, and it, you could argue that the, the, the widespread use could argue uh, his universal lordship. The other interesting kind of thing you'll discover in Exodus 35, you'll discover that the tabernacle was ministered to by women. And, of course, in Luke 7, 8, John 12, and Luke 23, our Lord was, of course, ministered by, to, ministered to by women. And so that's my little, that's my token acknowledgement, women's lib tonight, that uh, women's are, women are, are not overlooked here. Another thing, though, that I wanted to get to is we're sort of giving this overview relationship thing. Let's contrast the tabernacle. We've compared it to Jesus Christ. Great. Let's contrast the tabernacle with the temple. The tabernacle was temporary, and the temple was permanent, right? Tabernacle was designed to be used in the wilderness. The temple was designed for Jerusalem. And I'm going to suggest to you that the tabernacle <coughs> speaks of his first coming, the coming of sacrifice, a coming of... Uh, of uh, as a suffering servant. I'm going to suggest to you the temple might, in some sense, speak of his second coming. And Ezekiel, Ezekiel will have much to say about that in the close of his book. Thus, the tabernacle is temporary, but the temple is, in a sense, in a conceptual sense, permanent. Ah, yes, it was destroyed, but I mean the, the conception was permanent. The t tabernacle was erected by a prophet. Both of them are ministered to by priests. But the temple was erected by a king. Interesting. The predominant number in the tabernacle you discover is the number five. You'll see it if you look for it in many places. It's the number of grace. In the temple, of course, it's 12, which is the number of government, in the minds of some at least. And, uh, of course, the tabernacle, as I indicated, was something that had no form nor comeliness, had no beauty that we should desire it. Okay, it was, in a sense, speaks of humility. The temple, of course, spoke of glory in both ways. It was built to glorify God. And it was openly manifest as a testimony to God's glory. Now there's another thing that may be getting a little too speculative, but I throw it out for those of you that are attracted by this sort of thing. In the book of Exodus, we notice that from chapters 25 through 40, it's all in the tabernacle, except there's a parenthetical passage right in the middle. Chapters 32 and 33, right? And from our study of Revelation, we came to the conclusion that those parenthetical passages are very significant. They help to establish the whole structure of the book. These parenthetical passages show up all through the scripture if you watch for them, and, and they, they often can be illuminating. The question is, if that's there, and it is, then is it there by accident? I don't think so. The Holy Spirit may have had some subtle intention of 
inserting that parenthetical passage. We find that there is a expression, God is showing the plan to Moses, then there's this rebellion thing with a golden calf and all of that, and then the rest of the book describes the erection of the tabernacle in great detail. Okay? Now, and the actual erection is, is uh, you'll see the Holy Spirit very active in, in overseeing the erection of the tabernacle. Well, it's kind of interesting to notice that um, the original plan for redemption was given, yes, to Moses there, but in the, origin, in, the, in the true sense, where was God's plan for redemption first framed? He saw Adam sin and says, oh my heavens, we have a problem, we've got to fix it, right? Wrong. When did God ordain his plan for redemption? Before the founder, First Peter 1.20. It's a verse we've talked about before, but it's important enough to... First Peter 1.19, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, verse 20, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Okay, it's kind of interesting that the pattern before God was to reveal the plan, discuss it with Jesus Christ. There was the rebellion, the fall, and then the erection of the tabernacle, i.e. Jesus Christ being made flesh and tabernacling among us. Kind of interesting, huh? It's very interesting, too, that that's exactly the book of Exodus happens to describe it. There's the revealing of the plan, there's a rebellion and idolatry, and then the erection of the tabernacle. I think that's kind of interesting, but again, it may be a little, little far-fetched for some of you, so I just throw it out as a, as, a, as, a, as a possibility, okay? At this point, we've sort of rambled on about some things. Um, let's try to jump into chapter 25 and see how we do. Chapter 25, verse 1, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, verse 2, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering. Of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, he shall take my offering. It's very interesting. Even back here in the Old Testament, I say that in facetious terms as if, the, if we're subscribing to the Sunday school hypothesis that the Old Testament is, is you know, sort of rigorous, the New Testament is sort of, you know, we all have many naive students of the Scripture that think that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New are different. Okay, they superficially can sound that way if we don't really understand it. And uh, we have this, you know, God of the Old Testament which is kind of tough and mean and judgmental and whatever, and we have the God of the New Testament which is forgiving, and that's, of course, nonsense. Just Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But even it, using that idiom, even in the Old Testament, we notice here that God has no use for an unwilling gift. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need your money. He doesn't need your gifts. He gets along very fine without them. If you're lucky, he might allow you to participate, but he doesn't need us. And uh, I, I, as a businessman, I find you know, many guys who come to the Lord suddenly have this big passion to somehow help the Lord out. And uh, um, I wonder how long it's taken the Lord to undo the various projects I undertook many years ago to help him out. Uh, I, I would hate to be given a, an accounting by him of how far back I set the, spirit of, uh, the kingdom of God by my help. Uh, <laughs> Every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take in my heart. So you have an opportunity to invest. When the, when the offering plate comes around, or if you hear a project that the Spirit says, hey, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's an important one, you're given an opportunity. You don't have to invest because if the Lord needs it, he'll find it where he needs it. But if there's an opportunity, you have an opportunity to invest and gain a return. And it's no different than any other investment you make. And if it's, it, it, can, it, 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 will, it will yield returns or not, depending on whether it's the right one or not. And the Lord will tell you whether it's the right one or not. Anyway, let's go through the materials. Verse 3, And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and bronze, and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen, and goat's hair, and ram skins dyed red, and badger skins, and acacia wood, Oil for the light, spices for anointing oil, and for sweet incense. Onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breast, pardon me, in the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Why does he need a sanctuary to dwell among us? Where is a sanctuary today? You know, it's, I'm often reminded of, uh, without mentioning names, an elder was all upset. I had a friend, told a friend of mine that the children are chewing gum in the sanctuary. 
Whereupon my friend says, no, you got backwards. The sanctuaries are chewing gum. <laughs> According to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the furnishings thereof, even so shall ye make it. Now, what's interesting, I want to alert you to, and I don't, you know, is that God just doesn't tell them, hey, do it roughly like this. Be sensitive as we go here to the amazing detail that God ordains for Moses to do. According to all that I show thee after the pattern, after the pattern of the tabernacle. See, God, while Moses is up there for 40 days and 40 nights, he apparently gets a thorough briefing on exactly what to do, exactly how to fashion it, exactly how to set it up, exactly how to take it down, how to carry it. Every detail. And uh, God spends a great deal of attention on this. According to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle uh, and the pattern of all the furnishings thereof, even so shall you make it. Now the next uh, tw uh, tw 13 verses or so are on the Ark of the Covenant. Now there's something else that's kind of interesting is we're going to see the description of the tabernacle twice. We're going to see it here where it's described to Moses that he's going to go down the mountain and find this golden calf thing. We're going to have that whole mess and go straighten that out. And then he goes ahead and builds it. So I have two descriptions of the tabernacle between here and the end of the book of Exodus. This one is God giving it to Moses. And where does it start? From the Holy of Holies and works outward. When they build it, you'll see it all described again. And it starts from the outside and works in. This is God describing it from his viewpoint, from the inside out. We're going to see it later experientially from the outside in. Isn't that interesting? I think that's fascinating, just fascinating. As somebody pointed out, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the colors, the, the, you know, the stones and stuff in, in, uh, in Revelation and Exodus are backwards. You know, one's backwards to the other, well, because they're on opposite sides of the cross and so forth. It's interesting how the Holy Spirit leaves no detail. A couple of overview things here as we go I may have uh, wanted to do. We mentioned the altar of sacrifice, the labor of purification, the holy place, which is for food, shelter, and illumination, the holy of holies for the glory of the enthroned king. And we're going to go through the vessels, and we'll discover that the outer court vessels are made of wood and brass, and the inner court vessels are made of um, wood and gold. The illumination in the outer court is natural light, and the holy place is from the golden lampstands, illuminated by oil, and the holy of holies by the Shekinah glory itself. And the order of events here will be the ark first and the mercy seat, then the table and the candlestick or clamp stand. And then it'll talk about the curtain and the boards and so forth and the veils and so on, moving outside. For those of you that really want to get mystical, this description corresponds to the book of Ephesians in the heavenlies. The second one we'll come to, which is from the outside in, which is where you and I are at, from the outside in, Book of Romans. So the Ephesians Romans contrast is in effect here. Now we've gone through these materials. Um, gold, of course, is generally regarded by scholars as speaking of the divine glory. Silver speaks of redemption. It was a silver it was used as a redemption coin. It speaks of redemption, and we're going to see that used through here. Silver speaks of blood. Remember, even Judas testified to this for us. As he threw the 30 pieces of silver on the temple floor, he says, Behold, I have betrayed innocent blood. Brass has the capacity to endure, endure fire, so speaks of judgment or wrath. Now here, of course, we get sort of speculative. You really, we tend to perhaps lean too much on the inferences of scholars who have spent a lot of time in these areas. They tend to feel that blue can maybe probably speaks of the heavenlies, purple of the royal majesty, scarlet of the earthly glory. The linen speaks of holiness. The goat's hair speaks of atonement because of the scapegoat offerings and so forth. The ram skin can speak of uh, devotedness, the substitutionary ram, when Abraham offered Isaac and so forth. The badger skins or porpoise skins, depending on what scholars you follow, uh, speak of ability to, um, to uh, protect us. Because remember the shoes that were made of those for the children who lasted the 40 years and so forth. That uh, was a supernatural form of protection for their feet. <coughs> the feet speak of their walk, right? The Shedham wood, of course, which is used, uh, all this wood that is overlaid, in all through this thing, we have wood overlaid with gold. The wood speaks of humanity, and the gold speaks of his deity. 
And so wood is the one material of all those things that was once was alive. So it's used to imply the humanity of Jesus Christ. And wrapped in gold is, is, uh, speaks of that dual nature. And of course, oil speaks of light or the light of the Holy Spirit, so on. Spices will speak of the fragrance to God and uh, anointing there too. And the precious stones, of course, to the priestly perfections. And we'll develop that when we get to the, the breastplate of the high priest. A couple of other comments I'll make uh, 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 relative to the overview of this thing. By a rough calculation, there's about one and a quarter tons of gold involved. I thought that would be very useful to you. I don't know as most this is this is the, this is for your trivia quizzes. There's about four and a quarter tons of silver, and there's four tons of brass. And by my quick, I checked the Wall Street Journal today, and using the numbers there and running them out roughly, this thing is worth about twenty million dollars in just raw materials that I could find, ignoring. You know the spices and the linens. You know that just just you know that's just in the you know tradable commodities that I could quickly get my hands on. So, 20 million is uh, quite a building to be carrying around in the wilderness, right? Um, but incidentally, a non-trivial issue because that's one you're not surprised then to find them under attack a lot. Okay, no less than the Temple of Jerusalem being plundered was a was a major prize for for a conquering nation. Okay. And uh, I, have one, I have one last quiz here. How often was Moses in the scripture commanded to make the tabernacle after the pattern of the things that God gave him on the mount? Seven times, that's right. Twice in the New Testament. So you're going to argue that Moses engineered it seven to be clever. He had a tough time with Acts and Hebrews, all right? Okay, let's, uh, we won't make it all the way through chapter 25, but that's okay. The Ark of the Covenant, this is, of course, the center of the center of the center. In other words, the, the tabernacle is the center of the camp of Israel. The center of the tabernacle is the building itself. The center of that is the Holy of Holies. And the center, central implement there is the Ark of the Covenant, sometimes called the Ark of the Testimony. Verse 10, and they shall make an ark of acacia wood, or shittim wood in some of your Bibles. Kind of an interesting wood. What's the acacia wood? Thorn bush of the desert. By many scholars, scholastic learnings, probably the kind of wood that was burning in the burning bush, where the voice that called himself I am called Moses in the first place. They shall make it an ark of acacia wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. Now, for your quick calculations, I'd use 18 inches if you must use something. There are short cubits of 15 inches, and there's longer cubits of 23, 24 inches, and lots of others, in, you know, a lot of others. It's, it was, it's classically regarded as the length from your elbow to your longest tip of your finger extended, this distance. And, of course, because everyone's is different, they had standards. But you know, the Egyptians had their standard, the Babylonians had theirs, and there's all kinds of scholastic discussion about what a cubit was at various regimes, okay? in various regimes. And so rather than get into all of that, if you figure on the long side, it might be two feet. On the short side, it's probably like a foot and a half, maybe even as little as 15 inches. Take your pick. I don't think it's a big material issue as far as you and I are concerned. I don't think we're going to take tape measures to the Grand Gallery and the Great Pyramid and all of that trip. So it doesn't really matter as far as you and I are concerned. Verse 11. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, within and without shalt thou overlay it, and thou shalt make upon it a rim of gold round about. And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof. And two rings shall be on the one side of it, and two rings on the other side of it. And thou shalt make staves of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be borne with them. So you, get, you can sort of visualize this thing. It's carried much as we've probably all seen a, a, you know, a, a, a sedan chair or something carried, if you will. So it's portable. It's easily moved. The staves shall be in the rings of the ark, and they shall not be taken from it. And thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubim of gold. Of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end, and the other cherub on the other end. 
even of the mercy seat shall ye make of the cherubim on the two ends thereof. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I shall give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Now, it's my belief, some scholars might not agree, it's my belief that the cherubim were solid gold, as the mercy seat was. It says a beaten work, and some people say, well, that means that's, that's a term for covering wood with gold, like gold leaf or something. That's not what I believe it says. I think the mercy seat of the cherubim were pure gold. Why? Because they were not incarnate. Only Jesus Christ was. But that's just Chuck Missler's view. I'm not sure I'm right on that. That's just my view. Okay. The Ark of the Covenant. Anyone that touched it, anyone that touched it, unless it was according to the proper procedure, died instantly. That happened. David moved it to Jerusalem. And he wasn't supposed to. He didn't, wasn't sensitive to that. He had it put on a cart and hauled to Jerusalem with great singing and dancing and a big deal, bringing the, the ark up to Jerusalem. The, the wheel of the ark, on the, 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 the uh, cart, hit a rock. It started to tip over. I've forgotten his name, but he meant well. He went to steady it so it wouldn't fall over. Noble, noble action, right? Struck dead on the spot. Shook David up. David repented and, and had uh, you know a whole, a whole program there. Mourning the guy's death? Not exactly. That too, of course. But that caused David to realize that God had ordained a procedure for moving the ark, and it wasn't to put it on a cart. There's a whole elaborate procedure. And David was, in effect, violating God's law. Well, we'll be talking more about the Ark of the Covenant, but that's interesting, of course, that we see in the papers that uh, it may have been found. There's some positive aspects of that story. I tend to always be kind of cautious on those things. Uh, the fact that the Ark is probably in existence, in my opinion, is very likely. It, of course, was captured in the Israel's history and brought horrible things to the people who captured it. The Philistines actually returned it. And of course, they did. They had enough of it. They sent it back. And, uh, but of course, it does disappear from history. The question is, where is it? And uh, there is a, a secret group of uh, Kabbalistic rabbis that even to this day have a cult in which it is their mission, apparently, to preserve the secret of where it is. And when certain world events occur, they will reveal that secret. And that secret has been presumably maintained for, since it's been hidden. It's regarded, and everybody has it all kinds of theories as where the Ark is. The one that's always appealed to me, but I'm probably just as wrong as the rest of them, is that it's probably under the temple floor somewhere, since they were under attack in the past, and that was such a sacred issue, that having a set of secret chambers and hidden doors and whatever to, to, to secret it away, if the temple area was under attack, would be very, very uh, consistent with the thinking that one finds in the minds of, of uh, the, that people. And so somewhere down under the subterranean caverns of the temple area, there, the ark may be still hidden. And it's been the subject of a lot of uh, technology study, doing a uh, magnetometer flyby or doing uh, ground penetrating radar, etc. And all these kinds of techniques are being improved and being organized to try to, to apply to something like this. And of course, we know two things. We do know that the ark does show up. We see it in Revelation, although it's in heaven. So some people have, say, gee, maybe that isn't literal. We do know from a passage in Jeremiah that it'll never be rebuilt. So if the ark shows up at all in history, it'll be that ark, not a replica or a duplicate or something else. It is, of course, uh, uh, very obvious that if the ark should be located, they have to have a place to put it, and that the discovery of the ark could lead to the rebuilding of the temple. And it's for that reason that it has a great deal of interest to Christian scholarship, because as you well recognize, we're very interested in the whole temple issue. 
And of course, uh, those of you that read the archaeological papers and journals and so forth are aware of the Kaufman hypothesis. Asher Kaufman, about a year or two ago, published a set of papers which are quite convincing and have received quite a lot of scholastic acclaim, which seem to demonstrate that the temple itself was, is north of the Dome of the Rock, not where the Dome of the Rock is. And if the Kaufman hypothesis can be confirmed, then the, the temple could be rebuilt without touching the Mosque of Omar, or the, actually, say the Dome of the Rock. And uh, if, if that would put the Dome of the Rock in the outer court, exactly where John was told it was going to be in Revelation chapter 11, the first two verses. So it's kind of interesting time we live in. Uh, there's actually some substantial scientific expeditions being organized to undertake some of these issues. And I, it would, I would be frankly startled if, in the next year or two, these things are not found. I'm not at liberty to disclose all of the things that I've been exposed to, but from what I do know, uh, it would surprise me substantially if the specific location of the temple and or the discovery of the ark, maybe both of them, uh, would not surface in human history within the next one or two or three years, and that kind of a horizon. I'll be very surprised if they don't from what I know is going on. And so we live in very, very exciting times indeed. Ark of the Covenant. Okay, we will revisit that again soon. Let's say I think we can get the table of showbread in here uh, before our break. So uh, verse 23, thou shalt also make a table of acacia wood. Two cubits shall be the length thereof, and a cubit shall be the breadth thereof, and a cubit shall be half the height thereof, and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and make thereto a rim of gold about. And thou shalt make unto it a border of a handbreadth round about, and thou shalt make a golden rim to the border thereof round about. And thou shalt make for it four rings of gold, and put the rings in the four corners that are on the four feet thereof. Over against the border shalt, thou, shalt the rings be for the places of the staves to bear the table. And thou shalt make staves of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold, that the table may be borne with them. And thou shalt make the dishes thereof, and the spoons thereof, and the covers thereof, and the bowls thereof, with which to pour, of pure gold shalt thou make them. And thou shalt set upon the table showbread before me always. And the showbread, of course, is the bread of God, a type of Christ. Uh, we don't have to amplify this excessively. Um, you, uh, the showbread is, uh, we can just tie this right into our study of manna recently, which ties into the passage of John where <laughs> Jesus, Christ makes an I, uh, Jesus Christ makes an I am statement that can link to virtually every one of these pieces of, uh, of these uh, furnishings. And of course, I am the bread of life. Now, one other thing, we know that um, Jesus Christ at his birth was given, three, was given three gifts. Because there were three gifts, we always assumed there were three wise men, three magi. We don't know how many. We know the three gifts, so we jump to the conclusion of the three magi. Well, what were the three gifts? Gold, myrrh, frankincense. Gold because he's a king and he was to rule. Frankincense because it's the incense of the priesthood, probably, or something. And myrrh to anoint his burial, right? We know in Isaiah in the millennium he's going to be gifts of what, he's going to be given gifts of what? Gold and frankincense, right? No myrrh. That's past. Right? In the showbread. When we get to the instructions, I forget exactly where it shows up. When we learn how the showbread is to be baked, it's unleavened bread. And what do you suppose is put in it? Frankincense. Isn't that interesting? Speaking of his priesthood. By golly, we may make chapter 25. Verse 31. The golden lampstand. Thou shalt make a lampstand of pure gold. Of beaten work shall the lampstand be, be made. In its, its shaft, its branches, its bowls, its knobs, its flowers shall be the same. And six branches shall come out of the sides of it. I am the vine, ye are the branches, right? Six is the number of man. Three branches of the lampstand on the one side, three branches of the lampstand on the other side. Three bowls shall be made like unto almonds with a knob and a flower in one branch, and three bowls shall be like almonds in the other branch with a knob and a flower. So in the six branches that come out of the lampstand. And in the lampstand shall be four bowls made like unto almonds, with their knobs and their flowers. And there shall be a knob under the two branches of the same, and a knob under two branches of the same, and a knob under two branches of the same, according to the six branches that proceed out of the lampstand. Their knobs shall be, um, and their branches shall be of the same, and it shall be, underline the word one. And it shall be one beaten work of pure gold. One beaten work. One beaten work. Right? Are you at one with him? That's the condition. 
to be a light bearer. I am the vine, ye are the branches. Verse 37, And thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof, and they shall light the lamps thereof, that they may give light beyond it. And the tongs thereof, and the snuff dishes thereof, shall be of pure gold. And a talent of pure gold shall he make it with all these vessels. And see that thou shalt make them after their pattern which was shown thee in the mount. Very precise definition. And we'll have more to say when we meet again. The tabernacle. I urge you to uh, digest the remaining chapters. If you have the time to read ahead, get this in perspective. And um, we're going to talk about the other materials. We'll talk about the covering. We'll talk about the way it was used. You're going to discover at every turn a pun, an insight, a pointer to our Lord and our Savior and our Redeemer, Jesus Christ.